So let's start. Um, hello, and thanks for joining us. Uh, so welcome to this presentation, which is part of an ongoing Goose webinar series exploring issues and projects associated with global sustained ocean observing. Uh, I'm Albert Fisher. I'm the director of the Global Ocean Observing System Program Office um, based here at the Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission of UNESCO in Paris, and I'll be moderating. So during the next hour, we'll start with uh, at about a 30-minute presentation from Bernadette Sloyan, who you see on the screen there. Um, Bernadette is with CSIRO in Australia, but also plays two roles internationally. She's co-chair of the Global Ocean Ship-Based Hydrographic Investigations Program, or GOSHIP. That's what we'll be hearing about today. And she's also the incoming co-chair of the Goose Physics Panel, the Ocean Observations Panel for Physics and Climate, or OOPC. Uh, after the presentation, we'll conduct a question and answer session by chat. I'll be moderating, and we'll ask the questions verbally. Uh, I'll try to select questions that are representatives, and we'll try to attempt to answer as many questions as time permits. The chat window is open already in the lower right-hand corner, so if you'd like to start asking clarifying questions, please go ahead. Uh, this session is being recorded and will be posted on the Goose webpage. Bernadette is speaking to us today from Brest, France, and the Jacob Ops office. Uh, Jacob Ops provides technical coordination for many of the global scale in situ ocean observing networks, including GOSHA. So, Bernadette, I'll turn it over to you for the presentation. All right. Well, thanks, Albert, for the um, introduction and the invite to actually speak to everyone about the ghost ship and the current decadal survey we're in. So the outline for the presentation will be, uh, I'll give a little bit of introduction about where we've come from, so the background and the history of how ghost ship originated, and talk about some of the um, committee and how we're set up, so the committee members, the executive group, uh, and how we run. Then I want to move straight into talking about some science highlights we get from repeat hydrography and sustained um, visits to different parts of the ocean. And then I'll move back into GOSHIP ship itself, talking about where we're at now, uh, our data policies, the data that we consider important, and then the current status of the uh, global decadal survey that we're in right now. Okay, so. So just as background, um, most of us have realised that we've been doing hydrographic surveys in the ocean for a long time. So we think about GeoSex as one of those founding programs that went out and tried to measure the ocean through all the ocean basins at certain times. That was followed on through WOS, which was in the 1990s. It did a huge amount of work through the global ocean and tried to do a survey in that 10-year period of a um, synoptic system of the ocean. So once WOS had finished, and um, complementary to that was the um, JGOS experiment looking at the carbon and the biogeochemistry, they provided us with that first ever real view of the um, whole of the global ocean in the synoptic period. So remembering that the ocean timescales are a lot longer, 10 years captures some of those synoptic periods. We don't capture all of those fast, quick seasonal type changes. But after WOS, it was recognised that there is a value to actually maintaining some cut-down array of the WOS program to go back and dedicate every 10 years to going back to certain parts of the oceans on certain lines to do a full-depth hydrographic uh, chemistry, uh, any other variable that we can think of, um, survey. So that's where, in the initial period after WOS, we went into a CLIVAR system and uh, the international community got together and defined what we thought were the important sections in that were done in WOS and had been done perhaps previously in JGOS to continue those on in a sustained manner. Um, during that initial period of CLIVA where we started that, we realised that actually you, the repeat hydrography program is part of a global ocean observing system and we need to be separated from what might be considered more scientific or um, process driven uh, programs. So we formed the Go Ship uh, program and we really moved quickly in those early years of 2000 into establishing it as a very strong component of the Goose Ocean Observing System. And just to give you an idea, the two figures here, one is that, that WOS, uh, the one-time repeat sections that were done during the 90s and then moving on to what we consider as the sustained array in 
um, go ship. So it's a smaller version of what we think are critical sections that were done. So just as so that's our background. So we're introduction of to go ship to those people who have probably heard of the program but really don't know what we do. So we're looking at um, ship-based hydrography uh, sections. We bring together those participating nations, um, the PIs, so that we're all capturing the same qualities, the uh, same data, same quality of that data, and looking right through from the physics through the carbon cycle by geochemistry, and even more increasingly moving into ecosystems and uh, marine uh, pro um, sampling that was from, is still quite novel, but actually if we start moving in that, we'll get a complete view of the whole of the ocean in terms of physics right down to the uh, ecosystem. Um, we also help uh, in the deployment of other parts of the global system in terms of Argo and uh, drifting floats. So we offer those opportunities to some parts of the ocean that aren't as regularly um, uh, tra traversed by ships, such as um, the Southern Ocean or the Arctic regions. And as I said, GoShip is um, a very important component of the, uh, the Global Ocean Observing System and the Global Climate Observing System. So just um, to give you a bigger view of what the uh, reference section, so this map just provides information of what we think is our sustained array. We do come back to this to actually review how we're going in progressing what sections are being done and if we're seeing gaps in the array. So this survey um, is the, the one we're currently in, the Decadal Survey from 2012 to 2023. In terms of oversight, to make sure this is truly international and cooperative and each of the nations participating realise what's going on and the coordination of occupations of the different ocean basins, we have basically two groups. We have the executive group, um, which myself and Rick Wannenkoff in the US uh, co-chair, a number of people who are um, very important in terms of uh, setting the, the, um, the direction of the Go Ship community are also listed in that executive group. And more importantly, um, we also then have different country representatives. And we use these people as our conduits into each of the uh, individual nations that are participating or are likely to participate in GoShip so that the information is shared from both the executive group downwards but also from the country level up to us. And of course, really important is our project coordinator, Martin Cramp, here at um, the JCOM office. He makes sure we're all answering our emails properly and providing the appropriate information at the appropriate time. Um, and without that overarching coordination and dedication, I think we would still be a long way behind. So the whole group works together. Martin um, organises two uh, nearly quarterly meetings for us for the executive group via teleconference. And having those regular meetings actually keeps the information flowing. Martin also maintains the website, so those people who uh, haven't been to the website should check it out. It gets updated quite regularly. So the aims of the Go Ship program, they're to document that large scale water property distribution and the changes and the drivers of those changes. So here we're thinking about what's happening in terms of the changes of the heat and the salt cycles in the ocean, the currents and um, the tracer community, co tracers coming into the ocean. We also have a strong emphasis into the carbon cycle, so both the natural and the anthropogenic carbon, and the organic and the inorganic. Through the use of traces, so CFCs and FS6, we're looking at ocean ventilation and circulation pathways and the variability of those chemical traces. And importantly, as an um, added addition to those science goals that I've just outlined, we also provide that high quality full depth reference observations that many of our autonomous programs rely heavily on to actually QC their data. So I'm going to move on now for the next couple of slides to actually give you some uh, background about what sort of science we do with these. And I think it's really important that when we look at maps like this of the global ocean and the sea level rise due to heat coming into the ocean below 4,000 metres, 
that in the back of our minds we remember that this is a, a nationally coordinated or internationally coordinated national programs of research ships that happen through number of countries to actually give us this full global view. And without that international coordination and this working together, we wouldn't get this. No one nation can do this, so we need to do that through the cooperation. So GoShip is one of those programs that well, it's actually the only program that provides us with full depth ocean uh, properties. And from that, we've used um, that information, this is from Sarah Perky and uh, Greg Johnson, to look at the heat fluxes that are going into the ocean below the 4,000 metre mark. And again here, what we really see and dominating is that heat going into the ocean in the high latitude regions where we're forming deep water masses. And these are significant in terms of how much that's adding to sea level in those areas. Um, the other thing that we do, as I said, we're full depth, so the anthropogenic carbon storage, a lot of that information of the, well, of the interior of the ocean comes from GO ships, so we are strongly aligned to the um, International Carbon Program to get this done. Those data form that synthesis that we see in the uh, storage through the global ocean of the anthropogenic carbon. And because we're acting, a lot of our... Oh, our observations are taken on research vessels. We also do surface PCO2 measurements, and that gives us information again into those air sea fluxes. And I think that um, the figure of the um, SOCAT uh, surface lines of where we've got carbon observations, you see that particularly in that southern hemisphere in the Indian Ocean, that most of that high quality data is coming from the GO ship hydrography lines. So once we um, have produced those uh, surveys, we can now, we, as we're building up this time series of the uh, ocean changes in the decadal framework, we can then look at different changes through the global ocean. So this is looking at the inventory of the carbon, um, anthropogenic carbon in the ocean from other researchers who are coming in and using our data and benefiting from the work that we're doing. Again, you know, we can see, look at the decadal storage of that carbon through the time history, giving us inputs of where the decadal anthropogenic carbon is actually going into the ocean um, through the different ocean basins. We can then decide and decipher those signals and the importance of different regions in playing a role of mediating the carbon cycle and the climate change cycle. Um, and then some of the really quite interesting work we also get is from very high repeat sections that are done um, uh, mo multiple times during the decadal period. So this is just uh, an A25 or the um, Ovid line that the French occupy here. They do it every two years. And so this is a high resolution line. So the global program is made up of lines that are done once every 10 years, but there's a few dedicated lines that get done more often in that period and provide us with different temporal um, information, which all goes together into uh, understanding that the changes in the ocean from those uh, interdecadal periods. So we've had a look at some of those um, physical and biogeochemical variables. So another important one is the dissolved organic carbon compounds. So this is one of the largest uh, bioreactive pools of carbon in the ocean and again using the data that's collected from the multiple nations and putting it together into a synthesis product is where we get to really understand how the ocean is impacting on climate and both climate long term and the variability at different scales. And I also this is a very very complicated plot but what I really wanted to show is that um, it's not just that we go out and take temperature or salinity, oxygen and carbon, but it's the combined use of that data that's taken simultaneously that actually adds value to the program itself. So here these researchers are using the oxygen values that are coming out of the program combined with the CFCs, the carbon, using it in a, to a model to look at the differences between what the observations are saying in terms of um, the uptake of CFCs and what the model is saying 
And then that final cobble is the interpretation of that is that with the CF, more CFCs going in, it's actually younger water and greater ventilation, and the yellow is the opposite. So it's really important to understand that we collect a lot of observations, but those observations both totally in terms of the geographical spacing, but also their simultaneous um, collection provides us with huge amounts of information and data and interpretations that go beyond just a one section view. Sorry. Uh. And then, um, well, not a major uh, constituents of what we do, the, the second product or the second order observations that get done with the data that we collect actually provide high level or higher end observations of the ocean. So here um, we're looking at ocean mixing and the spatial variability of that mixing through a slice of the ocean. Of course, ocean mixing isn't something that is a key variable within what we call our level one suite of observations within GoShip. But because we're collecting the lowered ADCP and the use of that data in terms of uh, microstructure, we can get at these um, higher order variable questions of the ocean. So here, the, um, while we're not getting absolute values, we're providing order of magnitude issues of mixing. This is used by both the um, process studies to go out and look at the, um, the absolute values of mixing, but also in model studies looking at to making sure that the models are similar uh, simulating this variability in terms of the spatial structure of ocean mixing. So GoShip provides both those direct observations but indirect observations that are used by many communities within the climate group. So that's just a background of some of the observations and the uh, science output that comes from the program. So moving back to the program, if we look at what of our key observations that we take, we call these our level one data so we're collecting quite standard but very important uh, ocean observations from both physics, the biogeochemistry, uh, the ADCPs giving us current information and also underway and meteorological data on our vessels. If we move down to the level two, while these aren't um, viewed as critical or essential, they're still very important. So we have a, um, a group of other observations that if there is the potential to for them to be taken we actually encourage that they are um, pursued by those research groups going out in the vessels occupying a ghost ship line. Um, and importantly that you know as I said our level one data are our highest priority we recommend that these should be collected at least once per decade on the sections on some sections they're collected more than once a decade, um, and they may not be the whole suite. So we still highly value those, what we call higher frequency lines that don't undertake all of the observations, but that once in a decade that we actually do the whole suite on every line. As I said, the level two are highly, very, highly desirable, and we recommend that they're taken where possible, and we try and facilitate both the, um, the taking of both level one and two data across the network. So uh, where countries don't have the capacity to do all of those observations that are required by level one, we try and provide the opportunities for other nations to come on board to those vessels and actually complete the whole suite of the level one. And I think, you know, I can speak, for example, you know, the Australian sections that I help occupy, we. In our nation, we don't have the capacity to do CFCs, so we work with the Japanese and the US to actually make sure we get all of the full suite of observations, including CFC, where we had no national capability. And then we have the level three data, which are ancillary uh, observations that can be done according to opportunity and space. And more often, we're seeing a lot of uh, requests for us to do uh, higher end ecological or biological systems, and we encourage the use of the multiple use of our ships while we're at sea to get those done. So we see it as an opportunity for us to maintain and build the types of observations that could potentially come into our level one data. We're also mindful of that level one that we don't, dis, um, 
we don't make it too stringent or strenuous on people so that nations are actually feeling like they're making strong contributions to our program. Of course, um, I think as we move forward, we're all very, very comfortable with uh, stringent and open and rapid access of the data. The way the data is used is uh, really important to us and that it's used very quickly and um, into the ocean and science climate communities in a rapid fashion. So we require any nation participating in the GoShip to follow our data submission timelines. Um, so those level one and level two observations, cruise reports, uh, complete metadata, go through a preliminary uh, form that they're released very early, hopefully within a week or two as the ship finishes, and then the final calibrations are available within that six month period. That's uh, except for those data that actually have some onshore processing. And all data then are submitted into our designated data management structures, quality controlled and disseminated for synthesis. So then they're available to anyone in the research or public community to go in and grab that data and use it for their processes um, and studies. And we do ask that you actually acknowledge the Go Ship contribution because uh, these sections that are done from nations are all done within the nation national research founding environment and we have to prove our worth in the use of our data. So we really encourage anyone who does go in and use the data to actually acknowledge the GoShip program because that's the way we track our impact into society for use. So just to give you an example, this is probably a, a pretty typical uh, cross-section across one of the basins going from north to south. The dots are basically where we're using uh, CTD to collect bottle water samples. So Obviously, it's a 36 bottle rosette here. The density is higher in the surface, and as we move down into the deep, the density of um, water samples decreases. Apart from um, looking at the data and collecting data and going out to sea and, and designating the lines, GoShip is also very active in us maintaining the quality control of that data, the best. Uh, practices for the collection of data. So uh, a few years ago we updated uh, the WOS uh, hydrographic manual, now the GOSHIP manual, and we're still and very active in those programs. So currently there's a school working group for nutrients which GOSHIP uh, is participating in to actually ensure that there is quality and comparability between all of the nations and all the seagoing groups that go out and collect our data. It's really important that we're able to have uh, tracked the data, have known that it's collected in the right ways, the right methodology is used, and actually that's how we improve our methodologies by comparisons between the different ocean researchers groups of what we're doing and how we're doing it. So we're very strongly in, um, involved in those best practices through all of our research communities. So I'm going to move um, on, and so this is the current status of the uh, current survey. Um, you can see here that uh, the green are lines that have been completed already within this current period of uh, 2012 to 23. Uh, there's a light blue or cyan colouring here, and that's actually, we have three voyages at sea at the moment, so we have the um, ARC-01, which is done on the Healy, I think the US are out there, the Canadians are out doing the Davis. Unfortunately, Davis, well not unfortunately, but Davis is a highly a frequently repeated line, so it's here in green because it's already been completed in the current survey, but it'll be completed numerous times. And then uh, ARC-02, which is another Arctic region uh, survey that's also in the collection period right now. So there is a number of our colleagues right now at sea collecting these valuable data sets. Um, if then we move on, we have uh, our line designated with the, the blue. There are um, lines that have been funded and will be uh, operated and completed in the next few years. Um, yellow are lines that have been, that countries have said that they'll attempt to um, to complete, but the funding isn't yet there. And then red are those lines that as yet don't have any uh, country saying that we're going to attempt to do those. So then the next 
two to three years, those lines in red are going to be our focus to actually get nation support to actually go out and collect those lines. This map is updated um, quite regularly. You'll see uh, the line across the Wood LC. We had thought that was going to be occupied when uh, the Germans came out and did A12, so that's the line between South Africa and the Wood LC, but unfortunately they had ship issues and had to terminate when they got to Antarctica. So now we're back saying it hasn't been completed, there's still German uh, work that will be done there, but as yet we haven't seen the data. Or the, due to ship issues, the data wasn't collected and they'll go back again later. Um, I'll just give you some updates of the program. So this map is evolving and has evolved. Um, those lines, those yeah, those lines within the ellipses in the Arctic and in the Mediterranean Sea are actually new lines that have come into the system, recognising the importance of getting into the high latitudes and into some of the marginal seas. And one of the values and you know. Uh, the good outcomes of becoming Go Ship and becoming a recognised brand within the ocean observing community is that people see us as a valuable contribution, so they want to participate. And it, that's what's happened into the Mediterranean. Um, the Mediterranean countries want to have consistent and sustained observations of their full depth ocean, so they designated and became involved in our community and now have a, a line that spans the whole Mediterranean. The Arctic came in because of scientific reasons. It's really important that we track those high level, um, oh, sorry, not high latitude changes in the ocean. And so now we're fully participating in that. And that's actually been a really good venture because it's a collaboration between US, Sweden and Norway through different parts of those lines. Um, the other circle in the South uh, West Indian Ocean is a region that we know and we will be targeting in the future that we have a gap in the array. So if we look at the Indian Ocean, we have a line that goes from South Africa down to Antarctica. We have a very big gap in the middle of the Indian Ocean where we don't have any observations till we get to um, just past, uh, I think it's... Uh, 80 east or something like that. So it's a big gap in our area and that's a target area for actually fulfilling or getting in some more observations there. Um, I'm about to close so um, just for context, uh, myself and uh, as I said myself and Rick are the co-chairs of GoShip. Um, our email address is here if you have any uh, comments or questions you want to follow up with later on please don't hesitate to email. Uh, and then Martin Cramp, his email is there, who's the coordinator. Um, he's actively uh, monitoring our program. And again, if you have any questions that you want to follow up, you should CC all of us and we'll endeavour to answer questions and bring you into the community that is GoShip. I'm actually just going to leave it here. So I'll leave it with this current status um, of where we are in the current decadal a program. Um, when we made this map actually yesterday, Martin and I were really pleased to see we're mostly getting there. We've got a few lines to get some um, commitments on, but given the state of where we are in the program, we're looking really quite healthy for this current decade. So thank you for all joining us. Thank you very much, uh, Bernadette. Um, thanks uh, to all of you who are following us. Uh, thanks to Libby, who's asked the first question. But please, all of you, if you have questions, please type into the chat window. And um, why don't I start, actually, with Libby's question, how and where does one access GoShip data? So Libby, uh, the data for the CTD and the bottle data go through CCHDO in uh, the US, through the Scripps group. Um, the carbon data will go, um, is it CDAC, but is also mirrored at CCHDO uh, there. Um, I will be honest, we have some issues with some of our uh, shipboard ADCP and lowered ADCP. Uh, we're having a meeting on Monday where those issues will come up. So we're yet to find a national home. Those data mostly sit in the, oh sorry, we're yet to find an international home. This those data would sit with the national data archives. 
Bernadette, you, you talked about the ghost ship uh, missions or purposes, articulated them very clearly uh, related to climate questions, uh, circulation, fresh water, the energy cycle related to the carbon cycle. Um, the mission as the high quality um, reference uh, data for autonomous networks and sensors. Are, are there any trade-offs in those missions when you set the observing strategy or are they fully compatible with each other? Um, well, they're compatible. Well, no, I think they can, they're compatible in that um, I'm sure some of those autonomous array systems would like high quality ocean observations everywhere. But, you know, we have to be honest into, and think about where are the strategic places we need to measure in a decadal period. And I think, you know, as we constantly look at our program and those sections we've designated and it evolves, we're targeting those most important to that question. You, We don't target, um, and we have to be mindful of what our um, the program oh, aims and goals are. So for some areas, if you think about like the tropical Pacific, we're not getting in there in terms of timeliness because of the high frequency variability. But outside of those regions, if you think of what's setting the longer term or the decadal cycle in the tropical regions, we are. So, you know, it's always a trade-off between making sure it's um, a reasonable, affordable program and a high quality program that's going to answer your questions. How much of the strategy has been set by taking repeat sections, in, in fact, by the, the previous strategies that have been built up over time? And how much is uh, focused on sort of responding uh, as you learn scientifically to what you really need to measure? Um, a lot of it is on the repeat. I think that we do recognise the value of actually going back to certain areas um, that has been where we've evolved from. So we are repeating waste lines that were done and that may have been done in JGOS and giving that time series actually. So now we, in some sections at that decadal period, we might have three to four uh, occupations gives it value. So it's definitely that we need to be in repeat mode, in sustained mode along the lines. But that said, we are, and I had, as I did say, we do evolve. So the Arctic wasn't in some of those earlier programs, but we realised that that is an area of the ocean that is changing rapidly on those decadal timescales, and we need to start operating those lines there. And again, as we look into where we have gaps in the array in terms of um, no observations, the Southwest Indian comes in. So we need to start building, we need to maintain the program and the lines we have now, but we also need to be mindful of where we've got gaps, uh, where we maybe are over, not over observing, but where we have the ability to actually decrease and re-direct um, effort or national effort to poles in our program. Have you seen more countries come on board in, in having the capacity to do high seas uh, repeat hydrography over time? Um, I think... Um, so John has, a, John has a question um, which is consistent, with, which is similar to some of the questions I've been asking. So he said that in WOS we use the intersection of lines as a measure, uh, means of ensuring consistency between labs. Uh, ghost ship occupations are a little less frequent, so there's fewer opportunities for these intercomparisons. Is that a significant problem in terms of ensuring the global scale high quality data? Um, well, I think, you know, obviously it is. We don't have so many cross sections, but I would um, then say that a lot of some of the work that's now happening through the school working group contains those. Um, <laughs> Sorry, I'm just getting feedback here. Um, okay, so if you know, we don't have as many crossovers, so we don't have those as many opportunities to check the consistency between labs. But if we then move on and look at what we're doing through the school working group, particularly on the nutrients, that all of the major 
labs that participate in GoShip are involved in that effort and they're looking at their self-consistency between those. Um, and I know um, many of those labs will be participating in a, a, a scientific voyage to actually be at sea together and do um, a comparison of their observation processes and results in real seagoing conditions. So we have so we deal with it in different ways. Um, but yes, we don't have those repeats, but we have other means to make sure their consistency between the different laboratories. And you showed some results showing that um, uh, that the the amount of warming as seen through repeat hydrography in the deep ocean has been strongest uh, in the southern hemisphere, and presumably some of the biogeochemical signals are changing there uh, most quickly as well. Does that um, affect the strategy moving forward at all? Does that that area need um, more frequent uh, revisits of observations than decadal? Um, so, if we look at Unfortunately, our maps don't show the high repeat sections in uh, very well at the moment. Um, but if we think about where our high repeat sections are um, occurring, they are in that high latitude North Atlantic region and the high latitude Southern region. So, you know, the British do Drake Passage every year for physics, and so we can capture those um, significant changes in terms of that uh, quantities going in there. So. Given the um, mixed strategy of decadal repeats on some lines and higher frequency repeats of parts of the observation period at some times, I think we're actually doing a fairly good job to track those more rapid changes that might be happening in different parts of the ocean. Um, Libby has another question, which is about how, uh, are there any ideas about how ghost ship might fill in the blank sections of the South Indian Oceans? Have any countries expressed interest yet? Um, we have um, worked with some of our Japanese colleagues in, um, there was a call for their large scale ocean observation, so we have a pro proposal in with them at the moment to fill one of those holes. Um, and hopefully we'll, you know, we're waiting on the outcomes of that. So there are targeted ways that we're trying to fill those gaps at the moment, yes. Okay, and, and um, Akihiro Murata actually just typed a comment that in the South Indian Ocean, Jamstax has plans for a ship cruise in 2018, 2019, which is not yet funded. Yep. Um, so I really appreciated that you went through some of the really basic coordination tasks for an observing network to make it a systematic and coherent observing network, which is uh, basic coordination through the mapping products that you showed of who's doing what where, what, what's funded, what needs to be funded. Um, but also really the work on standards, the manual uh, for observing techniques. You mentioned uh, the different data systems in our first question. So um, my question about that really is is, um, is about the data system. You mentioned that there had been some um, some difficulties with that. What's What are your plans to improve that aspect of the coordination for delivery of the final scientific information out of Russia? Um, so I think, you know, uh, I will say that the carbon component and the um, bottle and the CTD data are really well coordinated um, through CDAC and CCHDO. So that part of the program is really well under control. The ones that we have issues with, you know, I don't think we should hide from them. We have been talking with people, regu well, actually here while I've been here, trying to find homes for those. There's a we will be discussing some of those issues on Monday, um, and I don't want to preempt who I'm going to ask or question, but we want to, for those data centers or for those data that don't yet have a national coordinate or international coordinated home, we need to deal with that. But the data isn't lost, they're actually sitting in the national um, data archives. We just need to be able to get it together either through a distributed network. Um, from a go ship website or JCOM OBS or actually get it physically moved to a central location. And we're thinking about both of those options at the moment. But it's something um, that's pretty, well actually it's really at the top of the list of things that have got to get done in the near future. Um, and myself working with Martin and JCOM OBS and uh, the other national data centers will tackle that as we go. But I think, um, 
Well, I would hope that in the next 12 months we've seen some movement forward on those. So continuing with the, the theme of data, you talked about the data sharing requirement to be part of, of GoShip. And it sounds like you've been able to make a similar leap in, in sharing and an agreement, a wide agreement across the network that uh, sharing data is quite important, uh, just like some of the newer networks like uh, Argo, the Argo profiling floats. Um, has there been some resistance, and, and how has it been overcome? I actually would not say there's not no resistance. Not I mean, I think most people realize the value of sharing. Um, it's obvious, particularly um, for those people who are at the really the front end of um, occupying these lines, that when we go to uh, national research centers asking for money, that they want to know that the data is being used and has been used and is frequently used many times. And the only way to do that is to actually look at um, open it, free access once the data comes in. Um, you know, when we do have issues and people, we have to talk to people, we, we do point out that everyone in our community, the research community, is very busy and strapped for time. Because the biggest issue is, oh, someone will grab my data and they'll write the nature paper. Well, actually, there's not many or very rarely a scientist sitting at their desk waiting for you to finish a cruise because we're all very time-strapped for research time. So the, once we get those people across the line, that you know, then they won't be um, stumped for that you know, vital research uh, paper, then the, um, their flexibility and their ease at uh, putting in the data on those timelines becomes much more um, obvious. And the benefit is that if everyone shares, then we can do the global synthesis much more quickly and regularly. And you mentioned the the, uh, the request that is to acknowledge the source of data when scientists use uh, GoShip data. Has there been any discussion about um, more systematic tracking of that, either using DOIs for data sets, uh, or which has been discussed in some observing network community, or another way to track how GoShip data is being used? Um, I think we have to be very flexible on how we are able to track data. Um, we have had discussions of DOIs. Um, I've had it nationally and internationally. And then when I do it nationally, I point out that, well, I don't want you giving my data a DOI because I might have another DOI in the go ship sections. Um, and, you know, I don't think these issues are... Um, particular to one ocean observing network. There are uh, issues that are being tackled by all of the ocean observing networks. And as we come together through uh, groups like the OCG, those issues can be discussed between the networks to find the best possible solution. And I don't think we want to do it individually. We want to do it as a, as a goose system. And how the best way to do that is um, uh, it's, it's an important issue, and we have to work out how to do that. Um, you know, we know if we're tracking our use of our data, I can do searches on GoShip, I actually then do searches on hydrographic line names and things pop out. So, um, you know, it's a, it's a challenging issue and it's also a, acknowledging that we have resource limitations, we have to do it efficiently and effectively across the whole ocean observing network. And just for those who don't know, OCG is the JCOM Observations Coordination Group, and I see that uh, David Legler, who's the chair of that group, is listening in. Um, so let me just uh, take a few questions that have been put up here. Um, so in fact, David has asked a question. David Legler, what are the prospects for engaging additional countries, some with new ships, to support go ship type repeat hydrography observations? Well, I think the prospects are um are very good and real, and we can see that um, we actually have our Korean representative online at the moment. So, you know, we're bringing com new communities in. Um, they're wanting to become involved, and so I think you know, we have those opportunities and the contacts are being made. They're becoming very responsive, and I think the future is somewhat bright in that area. And on those lines, we have a question from uh, Seku Tilian Bangura from West Africa. Any information about West Af African data that is um, available or planned for next upcoming ghost ship cruises? Are there cruises that come in and out of West Africa? West Africa. Um, so uh, we have uh, 
South African representatives here, and uh, um, I'm just trying to look at a map. So, West Africa, East West. Um, so some of those lines that we come in through um, across the Atlantic, those data are available. They're at CCHDO. Um, if I would recommend that um, for a more specific actual um, information about what the opportunities are, because there are a couple of funded lines through there at the moment. Um, the line from South Southern Africa down to Antarctica is funded. Um, to contact Martin or myself or Rick and we can give you more of those informations and the ability to then contact the PI whose vessel might be coming in and out of those regions. Um, so you showed the list, unfortunately we don't have it on the screen anymore, of the level one, the level two, and the level three variables that are observed uh, are recommended to be observed on these transect, these repeat hydrography lines. And we have a question from Libby Jewett is if there's any plan to include standardized ecological observations um, either in level two or I presume in level three. I think, um, you know, again, as we move into the GOOSE um, committee um, and the uh, ecological, biological um, equivalent to the OAPC and the carbon um, committees gets formed, we will work with that group to um, ensure that we can um, capture some of their essential ocean variables in the ecological space. And it's just a matter of us being able to define that um, list of variables they'd like to see. But we're really, you know, if you think about um, some of the work that gets done, um, those ecological or biological marker um, observations are more readily coming into the um, program through different nations. It's just that they haven't made it to a consistent sh um, list of variables that should be into the data one or the data two classes. But we'll definitely be working in that way. We realise that having an ocean seagoing vessel, research vessel in parts of the ocean provides those opportunities and we should use that opportunity to its fullest and utmost. And if anybody want to looks at the, looks if anybody wants to look at the list of those um, level one, level two, level three uh, variables, uh, Martin has posted the link in the chat box. Um, so going on uh, also about additional variables, you showed you did show some complementary data, such as the microstructure data that was taken on certain lines. Uh, in certain research projects associated with GoShip. What, what is the scope to add on to GoShip cruises with additional ocean observations? And, and what is, the, is there any kind of um, standardized process for that? Or is that so far um, been based on personal contacts between scientists? OK, I just, um, just one quick correction. So when we look at the microstructure data that I showed, that's actually from a standard level one data that we collect, so the lowered ADCP. It was more that. You know, from our the lowered ADCP is there to get velocity, but the second order use of that data is to get microstructure instrument um, measurements. So um, it's not that we've got a new probe on; it's just that we're using our standardised list to actually add value to the uh, observations that we collect in the ocean. So it's like a second order use of that data. Um, for anything that wants to be considered to be added, that's where the Go Ship Executive committee comes in, um, people should email Martin, myself and Rick to say we have this variable we'd like to be considered to be more widely taken on the, um, on the research vessels and we'll take that to the committee and have a discussion. You know, again, we have to be, uh, well, you know, the things that then will get discussed at the executive group is that we have you potentially a 24 bottle rosette or a 36 bottle rosette, it takes 10 or 12 litres. What's the water consumption? How do we integrate that? Are we going to, what's the cost? If it's um, a long-term pumping of uh, water out of some depth level back onto the ship, the time constraints on those issues. So all of that comes into it. Um, but we that's where at our executive group meetings we regularly consider those opportunities and those requests that come in. So the mechanism is actually to go through the executive group to get it onto our meetings, and then it will get discussed. Right, and, and you just mentioned in your answer that you really do have a rare opportunity to actually collect water 
uh, by being based on, on ships and having these reset bottles on the loaded CTD. Now, um, the ghost ship, which has its heritage and most in previous experiments, as you noted, it is really focused on cross-basin transects. And um, you know, I understand the logic, uh, which is linked to being able to make uh, these global inventories, also the continuity with the past. But is there scope for shorter lines to be associated with ghost ship or more coastal lines to be used? Um, and are they useful in some scientific context? Um, well, I'll answer the, first, the last question first. Yeah. I think coastal lines are useful. Um, it's whether they fit into the scope of what the aims of the Go Ship program are. Um, you know, we're really, and I particularly are very mindful of um, mission creep. We have to be able to provide the quality data that is said to be provided. Um, we do have... That said, we do have some short lines, so the Canadian group has strongly involved through very, what I would consider a short line, they probably may not, through the Davis and um, in, the, in the Arctic region, so the Hudson Strait to watch the water come out through into the Atlantic. I think our biggest um, concern, or not concern, but when we go to the executive group meeting of um, addition lines is that they are going to be repeated they will maintain the standard and the levels that we want, and they do do all of the data one quality that we need. Um, you know, it's, it's been a... If we look at the MED line that we now have it on the global array as part of our um, standard survey, you know, that was a, a one-off that started and then they wanted to do it again. Um, and it's been a work that we've worked through in progress to get that done. And so um, I'm not, I'm sorry, I'm not, but we're not opposed to considering them, but we have to consider them in the light of what um, the regularity of them will be done and um, their fit to the program. And obviously, there's no stopping anyone from using the GoShip manual and standards to try to um, to um, replicate the quality of um, GoShip observations. All right, Kent, do the the data streams for GoShip do they accept some of these other uh, hydrographic observations, or are they really because of their mission restricted to the GoShip repeat hydrography line? Um. So uh, CCHDO will accept any CTD data, I would assume. Um, the carbon, so we work with CDAC, so we're not the only... Um, CDAC take a lot of... Well, take all of the carbon data from all of the other carbon programs. So those data do go... Uh, those data networks that we use are not just for GoShip. They are for other research vessels and other observations that get done not that aren't part of the GoShip program itself. And typically, do, do the ships that are used for GoShip, are they large enough to have other missions on board, or are they really exclusively devoted uh, in a particular cruise to just the repeat hydrography and the measurement of all the variables associated with that? Um, all of the, well, most of the vessels that get done are ocean-class vessels there of a significant size. Um, when when the full suite of uh, level one observations and um, most or nearly all of the level two observations are taken, berths can get tight, but that's, as I said before, if the ship is out there, the berths should be full and we should be maximising the time and the energy and the effort of all of the research infrastructure to max to maximise the observation. So... Um, I would, you know, they're big vessels that are out there, um, and if there's a berth on them for uh, something else to be done, then the time constraint isn't too much. The PIs would consider it and um, look to facilitating any additional observations taken. And that's where it's really important that, um, that the ghost ship uh, survey and where people are going and what ships are going where is accessible to those other... Um, potential users of the vessel at that period of time. And so if anyone wants to see where vessels are going and if it's a ghost ship cruise, 
the information is stored at um, JCOM Odds and it provides that coordination um, system where then Martin can say, well, yes, that vessel, um, a US vessel is going to be in the Pacific and this is the PI, so you should directly contact them. So those additional, what you might call piggyback operations that happen will get facilitated through GoShip, but then the actual discussion happens with the PI and the other uh, parties that want to get involved. So let me close out by just asking um, a couple of forward-looking questions. So you obviously you have a strategy that runs through 2023. So you're early in your decadal survey. Uh, you know that we're thinking already about Ocean Ops 2019. We'll be asking the observing community to look forward to the, the coming decade. And do you see any scientific questions or drivers for uh, repeat, hydrography, forget, repeat hydrography observations that would potentially change the strategy of Ghost Ship, the observing strategy? Um, um, I'm just thinking, like, um, you know, I'd have to take that a little bit more on notice. I think, um, you know, GoShip is basically building a time series of the complete uh, ocean in terms of all of the variables, well, many of the variables that are important in terms of climate. And as we move forward and we think about not... Um, necessarily changing how Go Ship operates, but how it operates in conjunction with the rest of the um, observing system. I think they're interesting questions that will will play together. Um, I think most of well, you know, and some of those observing networks are getting together next week to begin those discussions about what's the complementarity. Um, between the different observing systems like the carbon observing system or Argo or GoShip or Ocean Sites and together how do we make the ocean observing system meet the requirements and the needs as we move forward. So I, th I wouldn't have that discussion solely around GoShip, I'd have it around the whole ocean observing system and the use of the deterministic temporal and spatial scales that, are gonna, that will be developed through um, the essential climate variables for the ocean and that we view it from that point of view and view it between the different observing systems. Uh, how do we, are we meeting the requirements that are set out in those essential ocean variables? And if not, what parts of the observing system are best placed to actually get to that uh, requirement? All right, so then I won't ask you my last question because it was really aimed at that, which is, um, and you've answered it in terms of the complementarity between observing technologies being where some of the innovation uh, in the observing system might come from. So let me um, close it there. We've used up our time. You've used up our hour. Thank, let me start by thanking you, Bernadette, for taking the time to uh, speak to us to um, about the GoShip Repeat Hydrography program. Uh, thanks also for putting up with the technical difficulties and overcoming them. And thank you to the audience for following along. We appreciate it. Uh, the next uh, Goose webinar will take place in about a month, and the exact timing will be announced via the Goose mailing list. So thanks, everyone. Thanks, Bernadette. All right. Thank you all. Bye-bye.